Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Rats, mice, and voles are unwelcome guests in the garden. Eagles, hawks, and owls help keep them under control. Also, there are many fencing options for the garden. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Mary Smith. Ms. Mary is the Backyard Wildlife Center Curator at the Lichterman Nature Center. And Mr. D is with us. Howdy. Thanks for joining Glad us. To be here. Thanks for having me. Mary, we like to have you here. <laughs> I like being here. Yes, yes. So, raptors. Yes. Let's talk about raptors a little bit. Okay, right? so when we talk about raptors, we're talking about our hawks, eagles, owls, and falcons. And these birds all have one major thing in common. Sometimes they're referred to as birds of prey because yeah. they're all carnivores. Okay. So they're going to be eating other animals. But specifically, the characteristics that they all share, which make them great hunters, are gonna be their claws, which in these birds we wow. call them talons. This is their most powerful weapon, and for most of the birds, it's what they use to catch and kill their prey. So not only do they have these sharp they nails sharp, on them, man. but they're also really powerful feet. So if you make a fist and squeeze as hard as you can, mm -hmm. that's your grip strength, right. okay? Probably the strongest person you know is about 100 pounds of pressure per square inch. Mm -hmm. But these birds, um, red-tailed hawks are probably two to 300 pounds wow. of pressure. How about that? Um, wow. But Man. our bald eagles and golden eagles, probably 10 times stronger than the strongest wow. person. They can do a thousand pounds of pressure per square inch. And that's enough wow. pressure to like crush, crush a baseball. Right. Oh yeah. my God, a so, baseball, how about that? Yeah, so try that at home. Try crushing the baseball. <laughs> that's why you wear these gloves. <laughs> that's, that's right, that's why we wear these gloves. That's right. So, but that's just one of their characteristics that make them great hunters. Wow. The second mm. one is going to be their sharp curved beak. That's cool. Okay. So that, um, looking at that curved beak, you know it's a meat eater. Okay. And they use that curved beak to um, tear their prey into smaller pieces if they need to. Okay. And then lastly, their eyesight. Most of these birds have really large eyes. They have really good eyesight, either seeing things at long distances or like our owls seeing in really low light. Okay. So those wow. basically, the eyesight, the um, sharp, curved beak and the talons are the three characteristics that make a raptor a raptor. All right, so what raptors can gardeners expect to find right here in the Mid-South? Okay, so in the Mid-South, we have a lot of different types of raptors, and it doesn't matter if you're in an urban environment or a more rural environment, okay. because we have raptors in both environments and sometimes the same raptors. Um, the most common hawks that we get here are red-tailed hawks okay. and red-shouldered hawks. Then we also have another group of raptors um, that like to eat other birds. So they're oh, wow. bird eating birds. Okay. Um, one, your namesake, the Cooper's hawk. Ah, um, is, that? Yeah, one okay. of our bird eating birds. Then we also have falcons. Um, so yeah. peregrine falcons, a lot of people know about those birds. Sometimes they um, will nest in big cities. But we also have things like the kestrel, which is a small insect eating raptor, yeah. and things like Mississippi kites, which uh -huh, are eating uh -huh. a lot of cicadas. Those are really fun to watch. They're really acrobatic. Then of course we have our eagles. We have our bald eagles, which along the Mississippi, their populations are definitely increasing and across yeah. the state of Tennessee and throughout the Mid-South as well. Okay. We also have golden eagles. They don't not as common here in the Mid-South, but you can sometimes get them in the winter time on short distance migration. And then we have our owls, and we have a number of different owls in the region too. Um, and so that basically is just kind of an overview of some of the raptors we have in the Mid-South. Okay. Now, why would we want these raptors in our gardens? That's a great question. So one, they're just great to see and to watch, but also they're gonna be helping with rodent populations. So some of these raptors are eating things like mice and rats yes. and voles, which I know a lot of gardeners don't like. <laughs> yes, um, so yes. voles, and then also they're gonna be eating snakes, mm -hmm. like we talked about some of them eat other birds. And most of the time these animals, these birds are taking animals that are sick or they're old, um, and so they're actually helping to control um, disease in populations and also just help control, po um, especially rodent populations. Wow, which is good. Yeah. We definitely need that. All right. 
So how do we attract? you know, these raptors to our gardens? So there's a couple ways to attract them, and it kind of depends on what sort of habitat you have. Um, but if you're in a more rural area, there are nest boxes that you can put up for some of our mm -hmm. owls, like the great horned owl, or even our smallest owl around here, the screech owl. They'll readily use nest boxes. But for our hawks that we really want to come and eat some of our rodent populations, one of the best things we can do is not to use rodenticides or uh, pesticides okay. because those pesticides are going to travel through the food chain. Mm -hmm. So if a red-tailed hawk sees a rat that's moving really sluggish, that's easy prey. Mm. Unfortunately, those um, uh, pesticides and rodenticides often move into the bird as well and, yeah. and often will kill the bird. So that's the number one thing we can do to help protect the birds. But we can also provide some good habitat, so large roosting trees and mm. nesting trees. I know somebody had a red-tailed hawk uh, in their yard. Yes, they have one. Uh, yep. uh -huh. So probably uh, in the woods. Yeah. 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 Um, and so they are nesting in urban areas too. Um, I read a story not too long ago about one of um, our owls, the barn owl, actually they've nested in Yankee Stadium before. Um, mm -hmm. So they can definitely utilize some of our urban habitats as well. But um, if you feed birds, um, if you maintain bird feeders for our songbirds, a lot of times they're also going, going to attract a Cooper's hawk ah, as well. Okay. Um, so they're not going to decimate your bird populations. They're just taking birds here and there. So um, that's another way to actually bring in those larger birds of prey too. Wow, that's good stuff, Mayor. So I guess now we're going to take a look at the owl. Yeah, so okay. we're gonna take a look at um, one of our raptors that we can find here in the Mid-South and look at some of the really interesting characteristics that it has. All right, so we have a friend with us, Mary. Yeah, so I brought um, a barn owl, B-A-R-N. Okay. And I always spell that because we have two owls in the Mid-South, a barn owl like this one and a barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D. Okay. Um, so sound very similar, but two totally different um, birds. And barn owls in the Mid-South, you're gonna find these birds in more um, rural open areas. They like fields or meadows or oh, wetlands okay. to wetlands. do their hunting. Okay. Um, but definitely a friend to the um, farmer and the gardener. These birds love to eat um, shrews oh. and other small, um, they'll, they'll also eat mice and, and small mammals, but they have been documented, a pair of them, catching like up to 60 uh, mouse size rodents in one that? night. That'll get rid of your votes for you. That's right. Good. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's for sure. So I noticed, Mary, you have your glove on. That's right. So like we talked about with raptors, this is an example of one of our raptors. They have really strong and powerful feet. Yeah. And so in these talons, especially in barn owls, they have almost needle-like um, talons. So they can pierce and really hold on to their prey after they catch it. Wow. Um, you can also see her eyes. Yeah. And so we talked about these um, birds have really large eyes and they see pretty well. Um, owls, their eyes are actually locked in their head so they can't move their eyeballs around like oh. we can. So that's why they have to turn their heads yeah, so that's often. One. Okay. Yeah. Um, and their eyes are so big compared to their, their body size. If we had eyes that same size, we would have like baseball size eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about that. Yeah, so unfortunately for this one and why she lives um, at Lichterman Nature yeah. Center is because she is an injured animal that okay. can't be released into the wild. It is against the law to keep these um, birds or even harass these birds. Um, wow. So she came to us because unfortunately she was hit by a car wow. and she is blind. Yeah. And cars unfortunately are um, one of the things that um, decreases their population. Uh -huh. And it has to do with the way they see. So we have peripheral vision, we can see out of the corners of our eyes, but with these birds, because they have the round eyes, it's more like they have blinders on, so they don't see the cars coming until wow. it's too late. Golly, but man, that's, that's, that's good, <laughs> stuff. good yeah. stuff. Look, so how do we protect our pets you know, from these raptors? Okay, that's a great question, and we get that question quite a bit. Now, the one thing you have to remember, if you have a dog that's 20 plus pounds, mm. there's not a raptor out there that can carry off that dog. Okay. All right. <laughs> so our largest one is gonna be our great horned owl. And so maybe five or seven pounds is the maximum that that bird, five or seven, yeah, okay. and they probably can't fly off with that either. Okay. Now, if you have a small dog or kittens yeah. or puppies, the best thing to do is keep an eye on them if you do see raptor activity in your area whenever they're outside and especially at nighttime okay. because it's our owls actually that are 
mainly the culprits of oh, the owls. It is, yeah, the great horned what owl. I would say is, is probably the biggest culprit of that. So keeping your um, smaller dogs and in, in, in cats inside at night. So watch over them at yeah. night for sure. Yeah, but most of the time these birds get blamed for stuff like that. But they're, you know, mm -hmm. a red-tailed hawk is taking something squirrel and chipmunk size, maybe a pound. Okay. Um, these birds are really deceiving. This bird um, might look like it weighs 20 plus pounds. It weighs between half a pound oh. and a pound and a half. And mm -hmm. so um, if you think back to like elementary school, birds have hollow bones uh -huh. and feathers. So those don't weigh a lot. And then their bodies are actually pretty small. We'll see if she'll let me do this. So if you can see how deep of feathers she has. Uh, so right now uh -huh. is when I'm touching her body. Uh -huh. So she's like a finger deep of just feathers. So actually pretty light birds. So they're not gonna be able to take something that's five pounds. It's five times as much as they weigh. How about that? Very great lesson. We yeah. appreciate that. I always learned a lot from you when you're here. So thank you much. Thanks and for having thank us. thank you too, baby. Thank you. Scarification. Yeah, yeah. That's one that we hear sometimes in reference to seeds. Mm -hmm. There's scarification and there's stratification. Scarification is a way to weaken, open, or abraze a hard seed coat because some of our seeds will not germinate because for a length of time until that seed coat degrades in some way. Now, if you're in a gardener, you can hasten that by scarification. Mm -hmm. And mainly the way we do it is mechanical. You can take a file, you can mm -hmm. take a knife, but what you're doing is you're just scraping or abrasing that seed coat to weaken it, weaken it so that moisture can get in there and it can germinate. Mm -hmm. And that's scarification. You can also do, do it chemically you know, with sulfuric acid and things like that, but I wouldn't recommend that yeah. for the home gardener. Yeah, I don't know about the home folks, right? <laughs> but I have definitely, you know, like beans, bean sure. seed is an example, canna seeds, uh, morning glory family seeds, nasturtium, anything that's got a, a hard seed coat would benefit by scarification. All right, Mr. D, let's talk about the kinds of fencing. Okay. Where would you like to start with that? Well, you, first you need to try to determine what you're trying to keep out okay. or, or keep in, or keep you know, in whatever, right. the, whatever the case might be. But, uh, you know, here in the Mid-South, uh, uh, probably the main critters that folks want to keep out of their garden or landscape mm -hmm. are, are deer, yes. uh, maybe rabbits if they have vegetable gardens, uh, maybe raccoons because they can create a lot of problems mm -hmm. around the house. Um, and you need different kinds of fences for for all of these critters. Probably not. There's no one fence that would work hmm. for all of them, with maybe one exception. Uh oh, what no, was that? no, it wouldn't work. Oh, would work. The raccoons would get okay. over. Okay. The raccoons would get over. <laughs> what, I, what I was thinking. All right. Uh, a uh, a privacy fence that, like a lot of folks, have a solid wooden privacy fence. Okay that would probably might work for deer simply because they can't see okay. on the other side of it. Going. If it's if it's you know tight enough where they can't see through there you have overlapping wood or, or, or lapping wood okay. um, because even though there may be something on the other side that smells real good like a, you know your vegetable garden or, 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 or something like that uh, they tend to uh, they can't since they can't see what's over there maybe they're thinking that there may be something dangerous over there. So right. they don't tend to jump the solid wooden fences, even though they're shorter than the, I mean, they could easily jump a six foot wooden fence. Jeez. The deer, deer can jump between eight and nine feet high. Yes. And, and they can jump probably 15, 20, sometimes 25 feet long. Wow. Uh, you know, that wide a spread. Right. Now they can't jump eight or nine feet high and 15 or 20 feet wide. <laughs> okay. I can't do that. Yeah. They can either jump high or problem. they can jump yeah. long. Right. So uh, a wooden fence, a solid wooden fence in a, in a landscape situation might do a pretty good job of keeping out deer. Uh, rabbits can burrow under mm -hmm. a wooden fence. So a combination of a wooden fence with a, a woven wire or, or you know, expanded wire sunk down from three to six inches into the ground, buried three to six inches in the ground, that combination would keep deer and rabbits right. out. Okay. And it would probably protect your garden. Okay. 
it wouldn't be cheap. It'd be pretty expensive, but yeah. that would probably do the trick too. for you. Yeah. Now the raccoons could climb that. They would they would scramble up the top of that you know six foot wooden fence and, and jump over. So that that would take care of deer and rabbit. Um, that's pretty expensive. Uh, if you have a large garden or if you don't want to spend that much money, uh, a real tall, uh, either metal or poly. Wow. They have poly deer fencing that you can make eight to nine feet tall. They would need to be at least eight feet tall. Uh, that would keep most of the deer out. Uh, <coughs> most. <laughs> um, but again, that's very expensive because you've got to put post and you've got to, you've got to do all that. And the posts have to be fairly close with with that a metal fence or a poly fence. Now, cheaper alternative, and this is one that uh, we use uh, out at Agri Center, uh, and and I even had to use it for the first time up at Murray State this year uh, to keep uh, uh, rabbits and raccoons out of some of our plots. Is electric fences. Okay. You can go to a farm supply store or, or probably uh, any of the hardware stores have have a, a fairly cheap just wire. It's it's a uh, it's a uh, real thin wire, uh, and, and 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 you can use a uh, plastic fence post that you push into the ground that are only like 30 inches tall. Mm -hmm. If you do that uh, for deer, you need at least two strands, in my opinion. Uh, uh, the top strand about 30 inches tall. The the lower strand about 15 inches tall. The lower strand will keep the little deer out, the, the fawns out, and the bigger strand will. I mean, the deer's going to walk up there and. Stick their nose to it, mm. probably, and uh, and it does a pretty good job, especially if you lean it out at about a 45 degree angle, and uh, that's what that's what we do at Agri Center, and yeah. it's keep it pretty much keeps most of the deer out of the uh, our our plots out there. Now, you might get by with one strand about 30 inches tall that would keep the big deer out, uh -huh. but the problem with, that I've seen with just one strand is that the fawns would walk underneath it. And then the mother's going to blow through there if wow. she needs to, and she's going to tear your fence all to pieces. Now, what about the raccoons, though? Well, the raccoons, the electric fence, see, it works most of the time for raccoons. You'd need a shorter fence. It needs to be ideally two strands, one about six inches off the ground, and one about 12 inches off the ground. Okay. Uh, I've had success. We had some success. We kept raccoons out of sweet corn up in Murray cool. State this year with one strand at about 12 inches off the ground, hmm. and it kept them out. And uh, it's uh, this is a planning where last year we had a 100 percent loss. Wow! Uh, of sweet corn, uh, they they ate every bit of it. <laughs> and and this year, as soon as we took the fence down, <laughs> we took the fence down during harvest when we started harvesting it. And uh, and of course, the harvest lasted a week or so. And as soon as we took the fence down, it was like. Yeah, they were they were <laughs> coming in, and we were getting some, and they were getting some, we it's were getting down, some, they were getting some. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think we out harvested like that. them. But uh, the electric fences uh, work really well, and and you might not have a power source. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Uh, uh, handy, uh, like we don't have a power source at Agri Center or at Murray, and so we use the solar powered chargers. Yeah. Okay. And you can buy those at uh, the, any place that sells fencing materials. And they're fairly inexpensive, and uh, you have to charge them first. You know, connect the batteries to, and then charge them. And uh, uh, you know, for like 24 hours before you hook it up to the fence. Uh -huh. And if you do that, uh, pretty good little shot. You okay. know, if you don't believe me, just grab a hold of it. Out. You know, it. How do you maintain those electric fences, though? I mean, I, of course, you have to keep the grass from growing up well, around it. Well, it's a, it's a, it's. The the new generation chargers will shock through grass. Oh, uh, how about that? If if the chargers yeah. will. Many of them will say that they they'll shock. You know, ten miles of fence, oh. and so they will. My but goodness. it's better to keep the grass, mm -hmm. and what and we do we use herbicides. Okay, you know, okay. we just spray uh, herbicide Roundup under under the electric fence. You can weed eat. Right. But but if you don't worry, if you get a, some grass that gets up in it a little bit, it's still gonna it's still it's gonna run right through there. It'll shock, shock right through there. They're, so they have really improved in the past few years. But uh, you know that's uh, the uh, and you can if you if it happens to be in your backyard, you can you don't have to buy a charger. I mean you don't have to buy a solar charger. They have chargers that you just plug into a 110 yeah. outlet and, yeah. and and they'll they'll do the trick too. That. Is really probably better. You don't have to worry about it. You know, if you have a lot of cloudy days, sometimes your, yeah. your uh, solar power charger can, yeah. can get weak on you. But that's the cheapest route to go is with cheapest electric route. fence. Electric fence. Mm -hmm. All right, appreciate that, Mr. D. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Be careful when putting up that electric fence stuff.
That's right. You be careful. This is a golden rain tree that we rescued from a nursery two years ago. It was stuck in a container and all the roots were growing in a circle. Uh, down here at the bottom, since I didn't mention the girdling roots, but what I'm more concerned about is all the roots that are growing on the surface that could be exposed to like drying out or freezing and desiccating. So we, we're going to apply some more mulch on this later today. But what I want to do right now is I want to try to loosen up some of the soil with this trowel and severe some of these roots that are like trying to grow on top of the ground and try to encourage this tree to produce more roots down lower. So I'm going to take and just very easily slice through the soil vertically away from the tree. And I think what we're going to do is encourage more feeder root growth further out. Now we don't want to go this way because it'll be just like transplanting the tree again. That's why I went away from the tree like so. This tree is doing, doing good so far. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Mary, you jump in there and help us out, all right? All right. All right, here's our first viewer email. I'm not going to be growing in my garden for one year. What cover crop should I use in the winter and the summer? Winter and the summer. This is from Hal. Okay. So thinking right, thinking yep. along the right lines. But he wants something for the winter and the summer. Winter is very, very common because yes. a lot of folks yeah, plant cover common. crops in, mm -hmm. in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a list of them, and I think I, I went to Oregon State University okay. and got what they recommend. Okay. And, and, and this is their extension site. And, very, and, okay. it, and it, a lot of the plants are, you're, you're going to recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, alfalfa, uh, yes. that's a winter. Of course, alfalfa you could also plant in the spring. Uh, Austrian field peas it would be for the wintertime. Winter. Plant those yeah. in the fall. Barley, you can plant barley in either the fall or the spring, and uh, it will grow. Buckwheat, this is a spring and summer one, so that would be okay. one that you would plant for, for a summer. Okay. Fava beans, I'm not really familiar with fava beans, but you can plant them in early spring and late summer, so they would work as a, they'd be a legume and, and they would work uh, in the summer. Garden peas, mm -hmm. I would be wanting to eat those. <laughs> Right. You know, that's a cover crop that you could eat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah, that, again, that. They're, they're fall, that'd be for right. winter, a winter cover crop. So there right. you are, You're plant right. you some garden peas and uh -huh. you can got a cover crop and a food. Oats, uh, Oats. spring and fall, annual rye would be, uh, it'd be planted in fall that. time and, and that would be a good winter cover crop. Mm -hmm. A uh, hairy vetch, uh, that is a, that's, a, big time that's here. a good fall yeah. one to, mm -hmm. to, for, for winter cover. And then wheat. And wheat. Wheat, yeah. which uh, you can plant in the fall for a winter cover crop. So. So there you are. That's a good list. Uh, yeah, but the vetch is something I know a lot of folks are doing. The vetch is a perennial. Under, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah, and that's what they're recommending with all of these yeah. is actually tilling them. Yeah, till they're them not under. recommending them. I guess you could no-till them. Go in there and burn that's them down. That's interesting. But, I think about that. Right. All right. There you have yep. it, Mr. Howe. Thank yep. you for the question. Here's our next viewer email. What is this plant? I think it's a weed that I inadvertently introduced into my garden. It grows from spring to frost and is about a foot tall with a dinky, fuzzy flower. Thank you. And this is Miss Victoria from Memphis. I looked at that. If you look at those leaves and you look at the, she called the dinky, fuzzy flower, I think it's mulberry wheat. Could be. Because it starts off in a cluster like that. Yeah, probably what yeah, it is. In a little I, cluster. You know, I couldn't find right that. Crotch. I yeah. yeah, so I kept looking at that and looking at the leaves, you know, down low. It's mulberry weed. That's what I think that is, Miss Victoria. Yeah. Probably. If that's the case, that weed is tough to control because it produces a lot of mm -hmm. seed. Uh, do you know about mulberry weed? Tell us I a little do. bit about it, huh? Yeah, so you'll yeah. start finding it everywhere. Uh -huh. It's very prolific. Yeah, very prolific. Yeah, it starts uh, developing seeds very young, you know, in this life stage. It one produces of those a lot of seeds. One of those invasive, so. Oh, man, it, yeah, it can cause a lot of problems. And it, you know, pretty much, uh, came up with the ornamental plantings. You used to see it a lot in flower Man, pots. Man, we have, we have introduced so many, yeah. so many bad plants into this country. Yeah. yeah. So Miss Victoria, that, yeah, I think that's what that is, mulberry yeah. weed. So it will produce a lot of weeds. That looks like a, yeah, it's a foot tall. Yeah, it's already produced a lot of yep. wheat seeds. And pull so, those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do be careful with that you know, and uh, get rid of that, okay? Here's our next viewer email. We like Blue Lake green beans. We planted the bush variety and they did well this year. We want to consider planting the pole version next year. 
Are there any differences between bush and pole beans we should prepare for? You need a trellis. You're yeah, going to need a trellis, need something Mr. Guy. For to that's run for on. sure. Because that but thing is going to climb. It'll climb and, uh, you know, you probably will have more beans <laughs> because they'll continue. You know, they'll, you know, the harvest, you can spread the harvest out. Yeah. And you can produce more per square foot. Right. Than, than with a bush type. Because the bush type is pretty much all at one time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. They pretty much they, they get ri they get ripe all at once, yeah. and, and you harvest them, and you're done. But with pole beans, it's kind of spread out over length of time. But uh, that's pretty much it. But you need like a pretty beans. strong trellis system. Yeah, like one that can understand uh, that can withstand uh, summer thunderstorms and, <laughs> and things like that. Right, right, right. And, and a little weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little yeah. weight. Yeah, a little weight. Mm -hmm. All right. So there you have it, Mr. Guy. Yeah, they're both good though. They yeah. are. Yeah. Don't you think so, Mary? Yes. Mm -hmm. Pole beans are good too as well. All right, Mr. D, maybe we're out of time. It's fun as usual. Yep. As always. All right, thank you much. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To learn more about raptors or garden fences, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. While you're there, you can watch over a thousand gardening videos or ask us your garden questions. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.